is when I'm talking about thoracolumbar spine trauma. Um, I know for myself at least something I don't know that much about, uh, particularly because we don't really do that here at the Western. Spines are mostly looked after by neurosurgery and we transfer out um, anything that's potentially unstable. Um, so in terms of overview, so I'm going to touch a bit on the background of spine trauma and specifically look at some of the Australian data and our rates here. Um, then looking at the anatomy and the biomechanics of the spine, um, which is very important at looking at the classification um, of thoracolumbar spine trauma. Assessment and investigation of the patient, the different fracture types we see and the classification systems for it, um, and then leading into management. So in terms of spinal injury, um, usually uh, it occurs in trauma patients, uh, so there's usually two groups. So trauma patients, so high en energy uh, injury, or osteoporosis fractures, so your low energy trauma in more older populations. Um, it's potentially devastating, and this is due to the narrow canal um, at the thoracolumbus spine and also the precarious blood supply, uh, particularly in the mid uh, thoracic spine. It's a watershed area for the blood supply, and uh, this can lead to uh, cord ischemia. In terms of some US data, um, there wasn't too much in terms of Australian data in terms of spinal fractures annually. But in the US, there's over 50,000 spinal fractures annually. Um, in terms of blunt trauma, about 3 to 4% of these are cervical, and about 6% occur in the thoracolumbar region. And it tends to be uh, in two kind of uh, age brackets um, amongst the sexes, so younger men and older women. And that's the younger men, so your high energy impact trauma, and the older women with your osteoporosis crush fractures. Uh, the thoracolumbar junction, which I'll come to a little bit more in. Uh, anatomy is quite important in spinal injury and uh, lumbar fractures can injure the cranial sort of cord or equina. So uh, spinal trauma and spinal cord injury in Australia, uh, it's among one of the most common musculoskeletal injuries worldwide. Um, as I alluded to, there's a bimodal incident. Um, so the 15 to 24 years tend to be your younger males, uh, so your road accident, traffic accidents, etc. And then uh, the older population uh, peaking uh, and usually females with osteoporosis. Overall, it's about 80% male. In Australia, there's about 350 to 400 cases annually of spinal cord injury, and about 79% of these are trauma related. Uh, Northern Territory and Western Australia have the highest rates um, in Australia. And just interestingly, following spinal cord injury, only about 55% of uh, people return back to the workforce, and it costs us about $2 billion annually. Uh, just in this pie chart down this back, uh, bottom here, kind of breaks down um, the main causes of spinal cord injury in Australia. So as you can see, about half, 55%, uh, is due to road traffic accidents. And those are broken up, about 55% are due to you being in the vehicle yourself, whereas about 45% um, is outside of the car, um, a standard by or somebody hit by a vehicle. The next highest group is falls um, and crush injuries. And this is again broken up into usually generally a fall greater than one metre, which is more your high trauma uh, younger patients, and then those falls less than a metre, which is more your older population osteoporotic type fractures. And then there's a few others. So looking at the spinal anatomy, um, so uh, there's 33 vertebrae um, within the spinal column, um, broken up into cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and coccyx. Um, in terms of the cervical spine, you've got your lordotic curvature. This has the greatest range of motion. Uh, so this is where you get the majority um, or the highest incidence of spinal injury. <coughs> um, second to that is injuries to the thoracic spine. Um, this has the greatest level of protection because uh, you have the rib um, articulating with the vertebral, uh, the vertebrae, which is also attached to the sternum. Um, and then we come to the lumbar spine, which has the lordosis. And I'll come in to... Uh, the junction uh, in a little bit more detail in a moment. It's important to note um, with your anatomy that at T12 L1 level is the canis uh, medullaris, and then uh, just uh, inferior to that, the quarter of quine begins. And this is important in lumbar fractures um, and determining neurological deficit. In terms of the function and biomechanics of the spine, uh, so the spine allows motion, um, it allows the transfer of weight from the trunk down to the lower limbs. Uh, it's a protection uh, for all our neural elements. Um, it's a ligamentous and muscular attachments, uh, which are very important in terms of spine trauma and determining treatment um, with stability. 
and the sagittal curvatures, um, so your lower diopters and kyphosis, as well as the intervertebral discs, um, provide resiliency to applied loads. Just briefly on the biomechanics, so with the spine, there's three main biomechanical regions um, in the thoracolumbar region in particular. So the upper thoracic, as I mentioned, this is relatively rigid, and that's because of articulation with the rib cage. Um, and here you get majority flexion type injuries, so flexion distraction type fractures. Um, further down, so lower thoracic um, and upper lumbar, so this is the transition zone, um, and this is where the spine goes from the kyphosis to the lordosis. So you suddenly get uh, a more immobile spine, becoming a more mobile spine. Um, and so you get an increased fulcrum of motion here. Uh, and this is where about 50% of spinal injuries occur because of that biomechanical property. Um, and then we've got the sacrum with a, a lower dose. So uh, just in a little bit more detail. So with the upper thoracic spine, the center of gravity lies anterior. Um, and so with axial loading, you get compressive forces uh, here anteriorly, where you get uh, more tensile forces posteriorly. Um, so as I mentioned, get you more flexion type injuries and uh, crush injuries, burst fractures, etc. Um, the lumbar spine, uh, the center of gravity because of the lordosis, um, lies posterior. Um, and so with a flexion type injury, this lordosis corrects and you get axial loading um, and this can create uh, a lot of burst fractures and compression fractures also. Just quickly, vertebral anatomy. Um, as we're all aware, as we go down the spinal columns, the vertebra are slightly changed a little bit in terms of their anatomy. Um, so the main uh, things to highlight, obviously, you've got your, your body, your spinal canal, um, your uh, spinous processes, and transverse processes, which are important for a lot of ligamentous attachment, um, and your facet joints, which articulate, um, which is also important, which I'll come to in terms of uh, stability in these fractures. So vertebral stability, um, I'll talk in a moment about the Dennis uh, classification in terms of the, uh, the columns, uh, the three columns of the vertebra. Um, stability generally requires a minimum of two intact columns. Um, so the ligamentous structures around the vertebral column are, are responsible for the stability of it. Um, and most importantly, you've got your uh, anterior longitudinal ligament, which lies anterior to the vertebral body. Um, and this extends all the way down from the spine to the pelvis. Uh, this is the, uh, this one of the most strongest ligaments. Um, it's quite broad and it has a uh, wide attachment to the vertebral bodies. Uh, the posterior longitudinal ligament um, is thinner, it's narrower and it's weaker. Um, and then the most important thing is the posterior ligamentous complex, which is here um, in the, uh, the third column. And that's comprised of the uh, supraspinal ligament um, your interspinal ligaments, your ligamentous flavum, uh, which is the strongest ligament in the spinal uh, column, as well as the fascia joint capsules. Um, with the posterior ligamentous complex, uh, this is the most uh, critical predictor of spinal stability, and that's what a lot of the classification systems now look at in determining uh, whether we need to uh, fix these fractures. Um, and these ligaments have very poor healing potential. So generally, um, something surgically needs to be done if they're disrupted. So Dennis uh, described this uh, column model theory uh, in the early 1980s, and he built upon this um, from previous authors and, and slightly um, altered this. Um, so he describes um, three columns of the vertebral uh, or the spine. So your anterior column, um, which is made up of the anterior longitudinal ligament, and the uh, one third, the anterior one third of the vertebral body, then the middle column, which is the <coughs> second two thirds um, of the vertebral body and comprising the posterior longitudinal ligament, and then you've got your posterior column, and that comprises of all your posterior um, ligamentous complex um, as uh, described previously. Um, so briefly on patient assessment, so um, as I alluded to, a lot of these patients are trauma patients, so you always have to approach them with your EMST principles. Um, emergency stabilization um, by means of a fluid delta of collar um, and spinal board uh, should be used. Um, and also obviously pelvic binds also any uh, suspicion of pelvic injury. Um, in terms of history, it's important to note the exact mechanism. Um, if it's a traffic accident, the speed at which they're going at, where they're wearing a seatbelt, etc. Because um, this can help you uh, in looking for what kind of fractures they're going to have. 
um, pain, neurological symptoms, and particularly bowel butter function. Examination, um, you'll have your primary and tertiary survey and a heavy focus on your neurological assessment. And then for uh, investigations. So briefly, I'll come on to these a bit more when we look at each fracture type. Um, so all patients should have obviously baseline blood. Um, in some of these fractures, um, particularly in the older age group, they can be due to uh, pathological causes. Um, so multiple myeloma screen may be needed and obviously your osteoporosis workup. Uh, plain x-ray is a, a baseline, it's a screening tool and it's good for assessment of overall alignment of the spine. CT gives you more brain detail and MRI gives you that soft tissue detail. So very important in determining if there's any posterior ligamentous complex uh, disruption um, looking at your, your ligaments integrated with discs and determining stability. Um, just interestingly, um, so particularly in osteoporosis, um, we see a lot of depression, uh, fractures in this age group and uh, there's a high false negative rate of 29 to 45% which was uh, seen in the IMPACT study um, where a lot of these are missed on plain x-ray. Um, in Australia we're at the lower end of 29% but still a lot of them being missed. Um, generally, these don't tend to be unstable anyway, but they can cause a lot of morbidity. Um, so now moving on to fracture type. Uh, so as mentioned, 50% of uh, spinal fractures occur at the thoracolumbar junction at this transition point where there's this fulcrum of motion. Uh, historically, it's been divided up into three main mechanism subcategories, um, and historically. Uh, classification systems have looked at two different factors, uh, stability and anatomy, um, and the, probably the most common one is the Dennis three corn model, and mechanistic uh, factors um, such as the Ferguson and Allen. Um, and the three subcategories they've kind of looked at are compression injuries, so that's looking at your crush and your burst fractures, um, translational rotational injuries, um, and distraction cuff injuries. So compression and crush fractures, um, these occur due to an axial force acting on a flexed spine and you get failure of the anterior column and generally your middle and posterior columns are intact um, if they're not well then they're probably looking at a different type of fracture. Um, they're usually due to either high energy, so in your younger age group, um, higher trauma or your lower energy. So this is where a lot of the osteoporotic um, women uh, fit into this group. Dennis uh, historically described four types and um, classified them. So type A you get disruption of both the, uh, uh, the superior and inferior vertebral plates. Uh, type B is only involving the superior end plate. Uh, C is the inferior and type D is you get involvement of uh, the action body of the vertebra itself. Um, Lateral uh, x-ray is the best way of picking these up and classically you get this wedge shaped type vertebra and uh, you're looking for loss of anterior height whereas preservation of posterior height. If there's any concern that uh, the posterior height um, uh, may be compromised um, then you need to look further because it's probably a preserved fracture and uh, therefore the middle column is compromised and they can be potentially unstable. Um, and these are uh, these uh, fractures are generally uh, non operatively treated because they're usually stable. Uh, your burst fracture, this is due to axial loading. Uh, so you get compressive failure of the anterior and middle columns, so it's a two column fracture. Um, most of these are unstable, however, this is controversial. Um, and in the literature, um, there's not really consensus um, exactly on stability of these and therefore whether these should be treated or not. Um, you can uh, get uh, canal compromise in a lot of these and that's due to retropulsion of fragments into the canal itself. Uh, Dennis uh, classified these into five different types. Um, similarly um, to the previous classification, uh, type A you get both uh, involvement of the superior and inferior end plate, type B is superior, type C inferior and then you've got rotational um, elements as well. In terms of imaging and burst fractures, um, so x-ray uh, is quite useful in looking at the vertebral heights, looking at your kyphosis angle and the interpeduncular distance. Um, and most of the literature generally uses about 30 degrees of kyphosis as your cutoff. Um, in terms of interpeduncular distance, um, there's not 
really general consensus, but about maybe two millimeters has been used. CT is generally the gold standard um, for assessing uh, bony compromise, and it can also um, lead to canal compromise. Uh, if there's any neurological deficit of the patient, then MRI should be used to assess for this. In terms of treatment, as I mentioned, this is controversial. Um, in the literature, uh, some studies say that you should fix these, other studies say that you don't need to. Um, obviously, it's dependent on whether there is stability, um, whether we're worried about compromise, um, particularly posteriorly of that ligamentous complex, um, and whether there's any neurological deficit in the patient. Um, Non-operative treatment um, is the use of the thoracolumbar orthoses, um, such as your PSLA brace, and uh, surgical management through decompression and spinal stabilisation. Particularly if you get that retropulsion, um, then you need to decompress the spinal canal and then stabilise um, the fracture. Flexion distraction injuries, um, this is what you might have been heard of as the chance fracture. This is due to an anterior force acting along an axis of rotation. And this is classically described as your seatbelt type injury. Um, this can either be a bony or a ligamentous uh, injury. Uh, it's a three-column injury, so all three columns are disrupted, disrupted. The middle and posterior columns fail under tension, whereas the anterior column fails under compression. Um, important to note in the assessment of the patient that 50% of these patients have gastrointestinal injuries. Um, a lot of them having a hollow viscous um, rupture. So a chest x-ray is important looking for this three gap on the diaphragm. Uh, in terms of imaging, x-ray is standard apolateral but also flexion extension views. And MRI is very important in these to assess for your posterior ligamentous uh, disruption. Uh, in terms of treatment, um, if it's a bony injury, um, you can usually treat non-operatively with a mobilization in your cast or your brace. Uh, whereas if there's soft tissue disruption, then they should be treated surgically. And uh, this is just what your typical radiographic experience would see. Uh, generally, it's um, a horizontal type fracture pattern. Uh, the last one is the fracture dislocation. Uh, these are more rare. Um, it's a posterior facet fracture dislocation uh, due to a rotation and a shear force. Um, however, although they're rare, they shouldn't be missed um, because they have high neurological compromise. About 80% can have paralysis. Um, they should have full workup with X-ray, CT, and MRI, um, and the treatment for these is always surgical because they are highly unstable um, and generally use posterior open induction and uh, instrumentation fusion. And as you can see here, you've got your fracture dislocation. Um, sometimes it can be supple, um, so if in doubt, always do an MRI to assess the posterior ligamentous complex. Um, and, and on MRI here, you can see uh, compromise of the canal. In terms of neurological injury, uh, injury can be either due to the cord, the corner of quieter, or a mixture of the two, and that depends on the level at which uh, it occurs at. Uh, if the injury is lower than the level of L1, it carries a better prognosis because it's usually the only nerve roots involved and not the cord. Um, injury at the thoracolumbar junction, which is the most common spot, um, can have a mixed picture. Um, but it can involve the conus megalaris as well as lumbar nerve roots, and a lot of these patients can get paraplegia. Um, interestingly, in significant lethal disruption, despite stabilisation, uh, most of these patients will not return to neurological function. Um, there's no real standards at the moment um, or guidelines regarding the role and timing of surgical decompression um, in acute spinal cord injury. Um, there's a few studies out there that say it's better to um, stabilise these early, um, within 72 hours preferably, um, mostly because it leads to uh, a reduced kind of recovery time, reduced re rehabilitation time. Um, however, there's no consensus um, and there's no big, I guess, randomised control trials or anything where literature agrees on this. Um, now looking at classification and management. Um, so historically, there's been very little consensus in terms of classification of these fractures and therefore how to manage them. Um, and so there's a lot of um, debate in terms of uh, in orthopedics amongst spinal surgeons as to what we do. 
Um, there's no widely accepted classification system historically, however, this is changing. Um, in the past, there have been several different systems, um, and as mentioned previously, these have either looked at or been based on anatomy and stability, um, such as that Dennis Threecorn model, or the inferred mechanism, and there's a number of different uh, systems that we use. The most recent one is the AO classification, described uh, by McGrell in 1994. However, these all have poor reliability, little prognostic information, and aren't really widely used. So that brings us to the most recent classification, uh, which has come about in 2005, uh, which is the Thoraco Lumbar Injury Classification Severity Score. Uh, this was um, designed or collaborate, uh, from a collaboration from the Spine Trauma Study Group. Uh, essentially, there was 40 um, spinal surgeons from around the world from five different centres who got together. Um, they came up with this classification system both uh, based on both literature review as well as consensus opinion from their experience. Um, and this uh, looked at addressing deficits of previous classification systems, which basically used to just focus on anatomy or mechanism and didn't really look at, um, importantly, neurological status of the patient, um, as well as uh, ligamentous um, stability. Uh, so the three clinical characteristics that are all looked at with this classification are injury morphology, um, and they actually describe um, radiographic findings um, to guide this, um, integrity of the posterior ligamentous complex, and neurological status of the patient. Uh, it's used for um, prognostic information as well as guiding treatment, and it has been validated, reliable, and has shown clinical utility. However, there, it is still fairly recent, um, and there aren't really any large studies um, looking at this in great detail. There's only one randomised control trial so far um, that has, uh, has used this, whereas all the others have been retrospective studies. So a lot of uh, further research needs to be done using this, but so far it's shown very promising results. This is a breakdown of what the classification is. Um, so as mentioned, it's looking at uh, the mechanism type, neurological involvement, and the posterior ligamentous complex. Um, so with mechanism, compression, translation, and distraction, so again using those three different um, subtypes um, that were used historically. Um, neurological involvement is broken up into whether it's intact, um, whether it's nerve root, or whether um, cortical is involved, and further broken up into incomplete, complete, and also not sure, basically. Um, and uh, posterior ligamentous complex impact uh, injury suspected or indeterminate and injured and it gives some radiological um, guidance and if you're not sure well then you should just grade it as being um, indeterminate uh, which gives you high points. So basically it's out of a score of 12. Um, so this is used to guide management. So with uh, the overall score, a score of 1 to 3, um, the authors uh, postulate that it should be treated non-operatively. Um, a score of 4, um, you've got the option basically, um, and fibre above should be uh, operatively treated. Um, as I alluded to, uh, it's a very controversial area in terms of management. Um, this new classification system is helping to change that. However, there's still a lot of debate among uh, spinal surgeons as to when we should fix something and when we shouldn't. Um, generally, unstable injuries or complete neurological <coughs> deficit um, should have early fusion with instrumentation. However, there is still some debate in the literature about that. Uh, a mild to moderate deformity or incomplete deficit, there's no real consensus as of yet. Non-operative treatment, uh, so you've got your medical management, so particularly osteoporotic fractures, those need to be worked up and treated with bisphosphonates, etc. Um, generally, these lower trauma, um, stable ones such as depressed fractures can be just treated with observation and gradual return to activity, symptomatic relief. And then you've got your hyperextension custom orthosis. And these are usually used for six to 12 weeks, depending on the degree of instability. Operative, so indications, progressive neurological deficit, uh, myelomalacia of uh, the spinal cord on MRI, gross spinal instability or failure of conservative treatment is sometimes an indication. And the approach that you use um, is determined by the site of compression and what surgical windows needed to restore spinal stability. 
I'm not going to go into a lot of detail to all different approaches because there's a few um, and they're a bit complex. Um, but just briefly, um, your operative options are um, vertebroplasty, so you get injection of PMMA into the uh, vertebra. Kyphoplasty uses a similar principle, except you uh, inject, um, you put a balloon into the vertebra, uh, the vertebra in question um, to inflate it and then inject the PMMA into it and that aims at uh, restoring vertebral height as well as filling in um, the defect and stabilising it. And then you've got surgical decompression and stabilisation um, and there's a number of different approaches and, and different kind of implants that can be used um, in more recent uh, times. We've got our pedicle screws and, and those systems um, which are quite successful. Uh, generally, vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty are used for more your uh, compression crush fractures and some burst fractures, whereas surgical decompression is more unstable.